my main intention for the book is that you'll have a new confidence in the Bible. Uh, you'll have a new confidence in the fact that we don't need to go hunting around in the latest cultural theories to develop uh, a robust, nuanced, sensitive, um, supple cultural critique. But it's all there. Augustine found this. Uh, and, and, and I want us to, to rediscover it uh, to the extent that, we, that we've lost that insight, that everything's already there in the Bible. Uh, we just need uh, to be able to draw it out and bring it to bear on culture. It's not as much really that this is the book that I knew that I wanted to write to begin with. It was that this is the book I really, really wanted to read. I am scrabbling around as an undergraduate trying to find books that take both the universe of these critical theorists seriously, that really understand them, and that take the Bible seriously and, and seek to remain faithful to it. And I just couldn't find anything. And I, I was sure that there was a book out there to be written. And so I began thinking in terms of, well, what would a cultural biblical overview look like? What would a Bible overview look like that engaged at each point in the Bible storyline with ideas from culture? And I'd also hope that Christians might be emboldened to be humbly and respectfully on the front foot about culture uh, more than we sometimes are. Uh, it sometimes seems to be that the, the only engagement of Christians with culture is to uh, rebut or to defend against accusations that have been thrown at the church. Um, but, but I think there has to be more to cultural engagement than that. And I want Christians to be on the forefront of setting a, a beguiling, attractive, robust vision for society, uh, not just defending Christianity against the, the attacks uh, that come its way. critical theory has, has shifted over the last few years, actually. It, it's tightened, it's narrow in our society. So when you talk about critical theory these days, most people understand that uh, to mean theories of society that are influenced by the Frankfurt School of critical theory. Um, Adorno, Horkheimer, Marcuse and so forth, a really quite profoundly Marxist outlook. Um, and people will also know that there's a critical race theory uh, that draws on, on some of those same ideas. But actually, that's only one type of critical theory. And I think if we restrict ourselves only to that narrow definition, then we really risk becoming blind to bigger things that are going on in society. And I really want to insist on a broader sense of critical theory. It's the sense that I was first familiar with. You know, I mentioned this unit that I did as an undergraduate, modern critical theory. That wasn't about the Frankfurt School. It was about different ways of looking at society and engaging with it and valuing certain things in it. And often these ways were really profoundly in disagreement with each other. And then I guess the question arises, well, if, you know, you're including Derrida and Foucault and Freud and Marx and all these other people, um, and feminism and uh, queer theory and eco-theory and on and on and on, as critical theories, then what is it that they've got in common? How would you define this broader sense? And the best way that I've come up with is that critical theories make certain things in the world viable in the sense that they, they make them believable. Um, they show you how to look at the world in a certain way so that certain things become possible in the world. Uh, so they make things viable. They also make certain things in the world visible. So they draw your attention to certain aspects of society or certain ways of behaving that you might have missed otherwise. And thirdly, they make certain things in the world valuable. They teach you what to desire, what to praise and what to condemn 
in society. And I think that's a, a good working definition of what a critical theory is. It's a, a theoretical approach to the whole of life that makes certain things viable, certain things visible, and certain things valuable. The introduction tries to set a vision for a biblical critical theory in our day. It talks a lot about Augustine and the city of God and what he's trying to do there and how that might be transposed uh, into a contemporary context. And it looks a little bit at Christian history and, and other attempts to do something like a biblical critical theory. And then each of the 20, 28 chapters really just walks the reader from Genesis 1 verse 1 uh, to Revelation 22 uh, and goes through the whole Bible trying to find at each point the particular patterns and ways of engaging with the world that are typical and characteristic of the different books of the Bible and then trying to bring those patterns and rhythms of, of biblical thinking and of biblical living in the world into conversation with non-biblical approaches to the same problems and questions um, and trying to get a conversation going between the Bible uh, and other uh, theoretical approaches to life as we go. There are three groups that I really pray this book would bless in particular. The first group is Christians who care about culture, care about our culture, but also want to be faithful to the Bible and don't want that biblical faithfulness to drag them away from caring about culture, but want to find ways of engaging with culture that actually immerse them more deeply in biblical truth and in the biblical storyline might be professionals working in the culture industries, um, might be Christians who, who just want to be able to think about culture in biblical ways. The second group is people who have a responsibility for explaining the culture to the church and for applying biblical truth to the culture. So pastors, youth leaders, student workers, small group leaders, and parents in families who need to be able to interpret the culture for those around them. And the third group is people who have a vision for helping to elaborate a Christian social and cultural theory who you know, may have read parts of Augustine's City of God and think there is something incredibly valuable that's going on here and I want to be part of helping to do something like that for our day. It might be undergraduates in uh, secular universities like I was trying to grapple with, with all the ideas flying around in culture from a biblical point of view. Uh, it might be researchers um, and people who want to, to give part of their professional life to developing uh, a biblical, critical and social theory themselves. My hope and my prayer is that it will give Christians both an appropriate confidence engaging with culture and an appropriate humility as well. And I think the confidence comes from the biblical truth that only God is good and only the devil is utterly and exhaustively evil. So if only God is good, Everything within this created world, all the cultural artifacts, all the movements, all the ideas, all the events, are going to have something good in them because this world was originally created. Good. And nothing has utterly lost every shadow of that goodness. And everything in this world is equally going to have something in it that's twisted and wrong and sinful. 
because this whole world is under sin until Christ returns. And that gives Christians, doesn't it, a wonderful openness to culture. Because if I open a book, if I go and watch a film, whatever I do, I'm going to find something in there that is an echo of God's goodness, because nothing is utterly evil apart from the devil. But I'm also going to find at least something in there, doesn't matter what it is, it can be a church, anything, it's going to be at least something in there that's wrong and twisted and sinful. And this gives Christians an amazing openness to culture because nothing is out of bounds. I, I've got to be discerning about any, everything. I can't dismiss anything without engaging with it. But if my ultimate measure of what is good and is evil comes from within this created order, say if I find it in, for example, um, the, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, or if I find it in, in the free market and uh, regulation, or if I find it in superstition and rational thinking, then there's at least one thing in this world that I can't critique, because that's the thing that gives me my measure of what's good and evil. And if I critique it, then I've lost my measure of what's good. So I think the Christian should be confident that she has an unusual openness to engaging with all aspects of culture. But I think the same biblical truth also gives us a humility because we are part of that same creation when nothing is exhaustively good because only God is good. And therefore our own judgments, our own takes on culture, our own way of seeing the world, it is subject to the same sinfulness and, and, and twisting by my desires and, and by my appetites, as is everything else. And so I think that the Christian isn't predisposed to go wading into cultural debates um, with some sense of her own you know, bulletproof, divine, inspired uh, truth. Um, that is reserved for God and for his word alone. Um, and so we, we engage with culture confidently. Uh, and I think we also as Christians engage with culture humbly. I guess that anyone who sets out to write a book like this probably needs two things. They, they need to be an insider to the culture and they need to be an outsider. And this is what Augustine does so brilliantly again in the City of God. He, he shows himself to be a, a consummate insider in late Roman culture. So, you know, he's taught to rhetoric in Carthage and in Rome. He knows Cicero backwards. He understands all the Roman gods and goddesses, even the ones that nobody's heard of. And he, he's got a, a sympathy for the culture. He knows why it sparkles to the people who are inside it. He knows why people love Rome and he can articulate that really powerfully. But he's also very fundamentally and unshakably an outsider to that culture as well. And, and this is one of the delicious things about the city of God because he, he looks at Roman culture and he just so many times you find him scratching his head as if to say, what on earth is this strange place I'm living in? He'll talk about the fact that you need three gods to guard a, a threshold, one for the hinges and one for the threshold and one for the door, you know, whereas usually one century is quite enough. And you can just tell that he can't bring himself to take late Roman culture completely seriously. Um, and so I, I guess I'm trying to be something like that. Um, I suppose I'm, I'm an insider to the culture because I've been teaching uh, thought and uh, philosophy and society in secular universities for a good two decades and publishing secular books on, on philosophy uh, during that time. And I, I guess I'm an outsider to that culture in the sense that I've been for three decades now um, seeking to live faithfully as a Christian, uh, not feeling completely at home uh, in this world uh, as it is at the moment. Uh, an exile, I guess you could say. Um, and so to the extent that, that I am qualified to write this, that's, 
that's, I think, what is important to bring to a book like this. I've always been really interested in how people think, how people who are not me make sense of the world with the tools and resources that they've got at their disposal. And I suppose it all came to a head when I went up to university. So you can picture me as a relatively young Christian in a big arts faculty in a secular university. And every week we're getting thrown these different critical theories to write essays on. I remember one unit in particular, it was my favourite unit at university throughout my whole undergraduate degree. It was called Modern Critical Theory. Uh, and basically every week we get a different critical theorist to study. We'd have a week on Derrida, a week on Foucault, a week on Marx, a week on Freud and so on. And as I was doing my best to grapple with these thinkers to try and churn out these essays on them, it, it struck me that they're all really doing the same thing. They're all making certain things in the world visible to us and they're all teaching us how to care about certain things in the world. And I had the great blessing to also be a member of a wonderful Bible teaching church during my undergraduate degree. And the, and the church was doing very similar things. Every week they were preaching a passage from the scriptures that had helped us, among other things, to, to see the world in a certain way to live in the world in a certain way, and to value things in the world in, in a certain way. And it struck me that the Bible has really fresh and engaging and challenging things to say in this conversation that was going on among these critical theorists in, in my unit. But nobody was thinking to bring it into the conversation. There was no sort of remote chance of the Bible getting a seat at the table in modern critical theory. Um, and, and that just struck me as um, incredibly sad and also selling the Bible short. I, I think that, that the Bible does have very powerful, innovative things to say in this area. And so I just started at that point trying to find ways of, of bringing the Bible into that conversation and trying to view that conversation through a biblical lens, I guess.